Here we go. Okay, we're recording. All right, so we are today in uh, Roman numeral three, letter C, number nine. We're going to talk about Passover, which is incredibly convenient because Pesach is starting. Okay, this is going to be the last class before Passover actually uh, begins, and and so um, and so that's uh, that's very good. So I'm talking there. Passover is special in many many ways. There are uh, it has uh, some prohibitions and it has some uh, positive mitzvot as well. So we're going to talk about. I guess first the prohibitions, then we're gonna talk about the positive mitzvot, and then we're gonna talk about how Passover is celebrated. Um, and then maybe a little bit more about how it would be celebrated, like what, you know, with some time left over, how it's celebrated this year, how you might think about Passover this year. And if there's a way that we could be supportive of you guys, um, you know, uh, for, for, the, for this year. The special prohibition, so Passover is a Yom Tov. Um, so the, the first day of Passover and the last day of Passover are holidays, like Shavuot and Sukkot and Rosh Hashanah, days when we don't do work or drive or use electronics or, or create things. Um, like those holidays and unlike Shabbat, we are allowed to carry uh, outside and we are allowed to cook um, and transfer fire. Um, so that the Torah says, you know, it's just like Shabbat, except you're allowed to do things you need to sustain yourselves and, and feed yourselves. And so we're allowed to do those types of activities on, 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 on the first day and the last day of Passover. Uh, and the days in between, are called Cholomoed in Hebrew, which is like the, which are translated as the intermediate days of the holiday. Okay, it's you're allowed to do work. You can go to work if you need to. You can go to school if you need to, but try to make them as festive as possible. And and uh, and those are the inter and so Passover and Sukkot are the holidays that have Cholomoed, these intermediate days. Um, in the diaspora, it's not just the first and the seventh day that are Yantif, that are holidays where we have a work prohibition. It's the first two days and the last two days. So in, in the land of Israel, the holiday is a, Pesach is a seven day holiday with Yom Tov on the first and the seventh day. In the diaspora, Passover is an eight day holiday with Yom Tov on day one and day two and on day seven and on day eight. So one, two, seven, eight, those are days without work or anything like that. Um, so, that so that's one of the, pro, right? so that's one uh, prohibition of, of Pesach is, is the, um, uh, the, the work prohibition on the, on the first, on the first days, and the last days. Passover also has a very significant prohibition, which is the prohibition against. So I want to say, don't shout at once. Chametz. Yes, chametz. Okay, we don't eat any leavened bread. Okay, we don't eat any leavened bread on Pes. Any leavened products. Thank you. Uh, okay, um, for whoever was that shared that. Thank you. Um, so we don't eat any leavened products on Passover for the entire duration of of the holiday. Uh, and um, um, uh, and so that means bread or cereal or pasta or cookies or anything made with grains uh, that have been allowed to be in contact with liquid. Uh, and you know we we, we are, are treat as though it were leavened. Even you know it's also true beer and liquor as well also fall into that into that category. Um, so that that's a very significant prohibition on on uh, on Pesach. Uh, and uh, furthermore, the Torah says not, not only do we have a prohibition against eating chametz, again a product of grain, uh, any grain products, we also have a prohibition against owning. Uh, chametz on Pesach. So you can't even have it in your kitchen or have it about, okay? Uh, if it doesn't belong to you, you can see it, okay? So it's not, not like a provision that's looking at it per se. Uh, if it's somebody else's chametz, uh, you, you know, you're allowed to, you know, have it on your premises, but you're not, a Jew is not allowed to own chametz on Pesach. Um, anyway, whether it's on his property or off his property or anywhere it is, you can't own it as well. It's not, so it's not just against eating, it's against uh, owning it uh, as well. Uh, and so, to rid ourselves of chametz, we really do like three different things to get rid of at least. We, first we clean our homes and search for chametz, okay? Because maybe there's a little cookie that you put in your, I don't know, like you put in your pocket, your coat pocket, you, you a granola bar, you grab a granola bar on your way to work and you stuck it in your coat pocket. And then uh, you were, you know, you were home for the last 10 months and you never put your coat on, okay? And there it is, okay? So that's a problem, okay? You gotta, you gotta search through and find the chametz that you might not realize, you know, maybe when you, last time you were your, uh, at your office, you know, a year ago, you had some cookies in your drawer and they're still there, okay? That, that's a problem, you gotta, okay? Remove all the chametz where the places where you might have forgotten about it, you have to search for the chametz to, in order to make sure that, not, that all of it is removed and, and gotten rid of. Um, we then nullify chametz as well, 
we sort of declare, I declare all the chametz that I own, it's odorless and void and dust, and I want nothing to do with it again. You nullify it, which actually is effective. The rabbis tell us that works. If we nullify it, why do we also have to get rid of it and search for it? So the answer the Talmud gives is that you might come across, you know, that you know, granola bar in your coat pocket and be like, oh, wow, this is really good. And you might eat it, you know, in, in a momentary lapse of judgment. Okay, so it's not enough to nullify. We also have to, um, we also have to declare, um, declare uh, we also have to get rid of, get rid of it and, and search for it. Um, uh, what else? Oh, yeah, so then also furthermore, uh, many have the custom of selling their chametz also, right? To somebody who's not Jewish, there's no, it's the only problem is chametz that a Jew, Jew's not allowed to own chametz, but if someone who's not Jewish owns it, even if it's in your cupboard, uh, that's fine, as long as a Jew doesn't own it. So the way, uh, so, so you know, certainly if you have like, uh, you know, lots and lots of, um, uh, lots and lots of stored something or other, it would be um, inefficient or wasteful to eliminate it all from your home, uh, so you can sell it to somebody not Jewish and then purchase it back after Passover. This is best done, not personally, like in a casual transaction, but via the synagogue. The synagogue coordinates the sale of chametz. Um, actually, this year we're not doing it ourselves. We are, for sort of COVID safety reasons, we're kind of sending all of our chametz to the Chicago Rabbinical Council, uh, the CRC. They, um, they are going to conduct a sale of chametz on behalf of, I think, dozens of congregations all across North America. Who don't want to conduct their own sale? Well, you know, we're going to send send the chametz to them. So you fill out the form, say this is what I own. I own, you know, ten boxes of Cheerios. I own, um, you know, a collection of single malt scotch, and it's worth, you know, five hundred dollars. And this is where it's located. And you sign your name, and you send it off to them, and they're going to have a stack, you know, they this tall of, you know, millions of dollars worth of chametz from all over North America, and they will sell it to somebody to a gentile who will own it for Passover, and then we'll sell it back afterwards. Okay. And uh, that, that's, that's also, so there's a lot, lot of like redundancy. We really don't want to own chametz. It's very important, okay? Uh, there's lots, lots of lots of steps we use to make sure that we don't own uh, any chametz. You don't have to sell. You can also, you know, get, it's probably better to get rid of it and not to have it any at all, but uh, uh, it, it's, you are, you know, the sale is valid. It's a thing that you could, uh, that you could do. Um, I have a question about the sale. Please. Uh, what's, um, what kind of rights does the new owner have to the chametz? I mean, we assume that they're not going to use it, but if we assume that they're not going to use it, how is the sale valid? So they could use it, you know, like they, they have total rights to use it. And on the form you put, the form you put in your, um, here, I'll show you the, if you go right now to, let's see if I'll find the, if you go to our show website, I'll share the link in a moment, right on the on the landing page, Pesach 5781. There it is, what do you have? And you have a whole thing here, sell your comments. So you're here, you can see the form. You can see you're, you're giving rights to the purchaser to come to your home and uh, and and take the chametz. So it's very unlikely, but they have that right. And um, I, I, you know, legend legend tells it that that one year, um, uh, a rabbi I know, a famous rabbi who's a generation or two older than I am, he he um, he sold his congregation's chametz, I think, to the synagogue custodian, and then arranged with the custodian to come with him on Passover night, on the Seder night, to the home of somebody whose chametz he had purchased. And he went into the house and he, you know, he knocked on the door, he says, hi, I'm here to take some of my chametz. And he, you know, went into the, he says here, it's in the closet. Yeah, you know, you have a collection of uh, fine uh, whiskeys and he poured himself a drink. And uh, and uh, so obviously the story spread, you know, and and uh, I think that was a way like make, this is a real sale. And this, this, this uh, seller, ha the purchaser has rights to, to come and take your chametz. Um, so that, that's unusual, but, but they, they do have that right. And there was a, there's a story, there's a story of a, you know, in the halakhic literature of a more fraught case of, of a, a brewer who sold his merchandise to a Gentile for Passover. I mean, it was whole business. You couldn't, you know, if, you, if you're in a, in a business of making beer or any liquor, right, you, you can't eliminate all your stockpiles before Pesach. It's like not, your business was not sustainable that way. So it's very important um, to sell the business and the chanets to someone not Jewish before Passover. But the person they sold to spent all the Passover in the, I guess, the brewery drinking the merchandise. 
and uh, like all day long, you know, so, was, so, so they were really worried that he was actually causing a pretty substantial financial uh, loss because he was just spending all day drinking the merchandise that he bought. So they couldn't tell him not to because it was his, right? And they, you know, if, if you, if they asserted themselves and prevented him from having access to the chametz that he owned, it would undermine the whole validity and authenticity of, of the sale and, and the effectiveness of the sale. So what they did was they just hired him to, to, for some other task that involved traveling to a different town. It was like a three days journey away. Um, so they, they, that they could do, they could pay him to, you know, please deliver this message to us, you know, in the next town over. And that whether they kept him away from, from the merchandise that he bought but that, without undermining the sale. But it's a real, it's a valid sale. Um, and we go through a lot of different, um, like Kinyanin, we do lots of different halachic uh, modes of conveyance to uh, pass the sale. I'll show you, I'll show you, um, I share the con. You know, we used, again we used to do this in our shul, and hopefully we will again. Uh, you know, next year. Um, let's see if I can really see. Uh, let's see here it is. Here's a sale here. Uh, here's from 2016. I don't know why it's what I found most. So I can find it. Hold on. Sorry. Hold on, let me. I share the contract. We 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 do all here. Um, In 2019. Okay, so this is uh, the last year we did this. Um, uh, here you go. So you can see if you want, you can see that you can see the contract that we used. Um, we sold to a um, a woman who's a, she's like a real estate broker. She's the one who actually uh, helped us buy our apartment. So she knows all of that complicated uh, sales and things like that. Uh, and uh, um, yeah, you can sort of see how, how we did it and, and, and all the, you know, uh, modes of conveyance, et cetera, et cetera. So we really tried to make, really tried to make it uh, serious, okay? <laughs> we have lots of different uh, methods of conveying um, ownership in order to, um, you know, sort of make this a, a valid binding uh, um, sort of thing. This is re this is really indeed more serious than I realized. Thank you so much. And for those stories about the, uh, the, um, the man who went and poured himself a drink. It's that, what, it's like, again, it's what? It's what? It, it's a, it's, it is indeed more serious a sale than I realized. Yeah, yeah, so yeah really, really so try, much. really try. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're very welcome. I, I really, I really enjoy it. It's one of my favorite uh, like things to do. And I'll sh one, one, one other thing I'll share. There, there was a fellow who did this for many years in New York, um, who died this past year, um, and, and so there, there was an obituary of him. Like, and uh, it was really, I think it's a beautiful, beautiful story uh, here. Um, so that's in the, in the chat also. So his name was John Brown. So he, for 40 years, he bought chametz for the New York Jewish community. Uh, and he sort of came to really appreciate it and they appreciated him. It was like a really special long-term uh, long relationship. So, um, um, okay. 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 Um, so that's prohibition of Pesach. Okay, so there's a work, ben, work prohibition on Pesach. There's a prohibition against owning chametz on Pesach. So we search for it and we destroy it and we nullify it and we sell it and we don't have it, okay? Uh, grains that have been made into matzah is permissible on Pesach, Pesach, right? So the same five species of, five, five uh, varieties of grain that can become chametz if they're baked within 18 minutes, they can become matzah, okay, which is used for for Passover, and then we use all of our um, we cook our foods without without grains, okay. So that's uh, we generally have separate pots and pans for Passover, so that we can uh, um, we do it that way. And uh, um, 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 yeah, we use so our special pots and pans for Passover, and, and that that's how we um, avoid the um, you know, avoid this prohibition. And we use separate plates and dishes and silverware for Passover because uh, just as in Kashrut, right, we're concerned not just about the thing itself, but the taste of the thing as it's absorbed into our pots and pans and silverware and plates. So, so true, so is true for Passover as well. And it's even more serious actually because normal sazazak kosher is nullified in 60 times its volume, a little piece of non-kosher meat 
falls into your pot, it's nullified in 60 times as fine. That's not true when it comes to chametz on Passover. It's not nullified. So a tiny little crumb falls in. So whatever, it's 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 bad news. Okay. So we're pretty strict and cautious. And again, we um, um, use separate utensils and you know we change over our kitchens uh, for Passover. Um, Um, okay. So those are the prohibitions. What are the, the mitzvot of the holiday? The mitzvot of the holiday, so first we have the general mitzvot like of, of any holiday, which is to celebrate the holiday, which means to have a festive meal, to have a festive meal at night, and to have a festive meal during the day. That means Kiddush is recited and we make motzi over two not to challahs, but to matzot. So just like any other Yom Tov, just like Sukkot or Shavuot or Rosh Hashanah, there's an obligation to have festive meals on the holiday. Okay, so that's true for uh, Passover, no less than those other holidays. There are additional mitzvot of the Seder night, okay? And again, the diaspora are the two Seder nights. There are additional mitzvot. Those mitzvot are as follows. There's a mitzvah to eat matzah um, on the first night of Passover. Um, there's a mitzvah to eat Maror, bitter herbs, on the first night of Passover, which is romaine lettuce or endive or something like that. Um, there's a mitzvah to drink four cups of wine on the Seder night. And there's a mitzvah to um, tell the story of the exodus from Egypt. Um, and once upon a time, there was a mitzvah to eat the Korban Pesach, the, the Paschal sacrifice uh, was eaten, you know, was roasted and eaten in every Jewish household uh, when the temple existed. So these mitzvot, the mitzvot of the Seder night, have all been kind of bundled together and incorporated into the ritual that we know as the Seder. So the Seder is the, the convening, the, the context in which we're able to fulfill the four mitzvot. Did I form it? That's the four mitzvot. But it's the, uh, that's not four. It's, uh, is it four? It's matzah maror, telling the story, four cups of wine. That's four. Okay. Okay, so the mitzvah, so the mitzvah of the seder night are organized uh, through means of the seder, and so it's it's the ritual eating and the storytelling and the drinking are all kind of woven together into this this incredible exquisite ritual, probably modeled on the Greek Roman symposium, right, where people used to recline and eat symbolic foods and talk about philosophy. Um, so we kind of and we took that model and used it to fulfill the mitzvot of the Seder night. Um, we don't tell the story in a straightforward narrative way. Like, how would you if I tell the story of the Exodus from Egypt? Okay, I'll just read the first 15 chapters of the book of Exodus. That's not what we do. We don't read, we don't just read the 15, you don't just read like in a narrative form. We, we, we approach the story through a question and answer form by asking questions and receiving answers. We take four verses in Deuteronomy that retell the story of the Exodus and we expand them through midrash, through um, extrapolation and interpretation. And in that way, the story is conveyed. Okay, the book that tells over this story is uh, that, that, that tells us how to fulfill these mitzvot in the context of this way of telling the story in a didactic learning way is the Haggadah, okay? Uh, which is the most widely published book in Jewish history. And uh, last night I shared some of my favorite Haggadah um, with, um, and uh, there, there are many, okay? And you can, you can find them online, you can find them, you know, I'll, I'll, and I'll so we'll give you one resource, resource you wanna make your own. Um, there, I'll show you that in one moment. Um, I'll show you the here. Here's like some online resources for 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 the Passover Seder. Okay, and you can take a look and and uh, and you can see the DIY Haggadah. Right, you can make you know the the Haggadah is a public access. You know, it's a public domain text, so you can you know make your own by adding pictures and questions and uh, whatever, whatever you want. Um, you know, and, and and of course the festive meal is also like the festive meal of the night is also incorporated into the Haggadah. So all the mitzvot of the day, uh, of the night, right, are sort of incorporated into this, including the meal, uh, are incorporated into the, the Haggadah. So the four cups of wine correspond to four segments of this ritual meal um, and the four mitzvot are kind of corresponding, you know, sort of interwoven with these four cups of wine. Um, 
it's exquisite. Okay, I, I've, um, is there, have any of you never been to a Passover Seder? Is, that, is anyone, is that? Anyone? Okay, there's nothing I'm gonna say right now. Okay, it, it should be, it's really fun. I, you know, in a better year, I'd have you over, have all of you over to our house for, for Passover. Um, it, it, it's really, um, I'm sorry, we can't, we can't have more of you over, have, have you over this year, but uh, um, who's got next year, we'll be able to have more hospitality and, and have people over in our homes and find you other homes where people can host you and it should be really pleasant. Okay, so, so the last thing I want to say about Passover, I guess, is the celebration of the day. So it's, it's uh, you know, the custom is to eat, to celebrate the Seder, not, not, you know, in isolation, as many of us unfortunately have to do this year, but with extended family and with community, with friends. Uh, this harkens back to the original way in which the Paschal sacrifice was eaten um, in the times of the temple when the sacrifice had to be eaten all in one night and you couldn't leave leftovers. And so you would form together households to household to household. Maybe dozens of people would share one Paschal sacrifice and eat it together and celebrate Passover together. So that was, um, uh, that was done back then. So we have a, a Seder, we have the Seder in large numbers together in, in groups of extended family. Um, um, the daytime celebrations of the holiday, it's similar to other, other holidays, um, similar to Zukot and Rish, you know, there's, you know, prayer, it's a, the tefillah, the prayers are similar to Shabbat prayers, but slightly different. Um, Instead of the Shabbat Amidah, it's the Yom Tov Amidah. Um, so it's, in that sense, it's different from what you're used to if you come to Shul and Shabbat, but it's the same basic format. We recite Hallel, festive Psalms on, on Passover um, as, as on other holidays. Um, the last days of Passover is, is Yom Tov, also, but there's no Seder. So it's a day without work and a day, you know, of being in Shul and all that, but there's no, there's no Seder. So it's just a more simple, simple Yom Tov. All right, any, any questions about Passover? It's sort of there's a big overview. There's already like 30,000 foot view. Any, anything like you're curious about or that I alluded to that you have follow-up questions on? Do you have plans yet? Do you know what you're doing? No? Okay. So, I'm sorry? Can I ask another question? Please. Yeah. Um, the uh, the thing that you mentioned earlier about the restrictions for Pesach going into effect on Shabbat, and I think you said the late morning. Yeah. Yes. Um, can you uh, tell us about that? Yeah. So so uh, that's true every year, right? The, the restrictions against eating chametz um, starts before Passover itself. No, um, but I mean like how it's calculated, like what, uh, why why oh. how that came to be. Yeah. So, so the the um, the. So in, in Jewish law, time is divided. They didn't have like hours um, that were like fixed. They had relative hours that were sort of a portion of the daylight. So the daylight is divided into 12 and that's called a halakhic hour. So six hours is always midday and four hours is mid-morning. So I think so. I think four hours is I believe the the end of how, you know, when, when you have to stop eating chametz. So it's actually a pretty simple time, right? So the rabbi said as a, as a fence to make sure people don't eat chametz on Pesach, you have to be done with your chametz by the fourth hour of the morning. So, so that seems very simple, but the fourth hour is actually, if you want to translate that into, uh, you know, you know our, 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 our time, you have to take the daylight hours and divide it by 12 and then do four of them. And that's, that, that gets you to some of the late morning. I, I don't remember the time, but here, here I'll show you another resource. If you go to, I'll send you another website. Um, is and you do uh, change date February Friday the twenty sixth. Uh, apply here. So it's in the, it's in the chat. You can see customized for uh, for our location. And uh, you can see uh, for that Friday, right? So the latest time to eat burning chametz, it's either 11.42 or 11.54, okay? So you have to get rid of your chametz by then. Um, um, let me see all the other, all the times there. If you, so, so this is a cool website. You can put any location on the planet and we'll give you all the relevant uh, times in Jewish law for that day. Did that answer your question? Is that what you're getting at? Or something was something a little more or is it a different direction? Uh, no, I mean that was that answered my question. I think you said that there was a rabbi whose name I didn't catch who said in order to be safe, 
be finished it's by the quite, it's, not, it's the rabbis, meaning it's, this is the Talmud. It's already it goes back to the Talmud. The Talmud discusses. Okay. Uh, nobody's name. In does the pro- hmm? No, nobody's name is associated with it in particular. I I, I don't recall the, this guy. There might be somebody originally, but it's it's a universal practice going back thousands of years at this point that we that the prohibition begins before you know on the day before Passover, which is complicated this year because it's Shabbat, so you have to have your Shabbat meals, you know, before. The prohibition against eating chametz. You have to, let, you know, they have to have the challah for your Shabbat daytime meals uh, before the prohibition against eating chametz takes effect. Isn't there normally a third meal that is in the, the third afternoon? meal in the afternoon is a big question on years like this. So either you have the third meal with challah in the morning, or you have the third meal without challah in the afternoon. Those are basically the two approaches. Uh, there's no, it, there's no like perfect solution to a year like this one. Uh, this one, I'm going to be speaking about this on Thursday. Uh, so. Uh, you're welcome to join the class on Thursday. We're gonna I would be delighted. These questions. Sure. Yeah. Um, but it's yeah, everyone, sort of everyone's like wondering. And in fact, we even have like a little, I think I, we should have um, already on the website. Yeah, Pesach Fies, you know, the free FAQ, little FAQ document here on, uh, yeah, you can, I'll share that too. This is from the show website, but we sort of go through some of these, some of these, you know, a very like uh, simple way. Um, um, so if, if you're, look, if you're, if it was a normal year, I would say, again, I'd make sure you were invited to our house or to someone else's house. You wouldn't have to do Passover by yourself. If you're living alone and you're not able to join with others, as is very appropriate, because we're all trying to be safe and to be good citizens, et cetera, and not spread uh, deadly diseases. So you may be by yourself, but you're going to do it by yourself. You do it by yourself. Like you can, you know, um, you can get a Haggadah and you could have four cups of wine, you could have matzah and maror and you could eat the foods and tell the story and ask questions and answer them and, and, and engage on your own. It's, it's, and that's not, it's not ideal, but uh, people have celebrated Passover under much harder circumstances in the past than that. And it's, it's really, it is possible and then you'll do it and you'll it'll be, uh, and please God in future years, you'll be able to do it with, uh, you know, you know, groaning tables and lots of friends and family around and it won't have to be like this again, which I know we thought last year, but this is really, I think this is really true, I think. Okay. Um, any other questions about Passover? Anything I just said? Okay. Reach out. Please, please reach out, especially if, like, as you think of questions, things come up, please reach out. The sooner you reach out with questions, the more time I have to look up the answers if I don't know them, okay? So, so please um, circle back with, with questions so that can be helpful. All right, back on the syllabus, what's the next item? We have... Um, 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 a lot of open tabs. Let me find where I put it. Sorry. No, here it is. Okay. Uh, Pesach Sheni. I'm talking about Pesach Sheni. And okay. Um, okay. We'll do finish. Okay. Pesach Sheni. We'll do nine, ten, and then we'll pause. Um, Pesach Sheni. The time of the Torah. Uh, people who weren't able to participate in this in the Paschal sacrifice because they were ritually impure. They were too far away. We're not able to. So the Torah says you can observe, have your like a makeup opportunity a month after Passover called Pesach Sheni. And that was an option that existed in temple times. You could bring your carbon Pesach on real Passover, first Passover or second Passover. Okay. For people in certain circumstances, like if you weren't able to, yeah, you weren't able to um, participate the first time you're too far or whatever, or you were impure. There's no Korban Pesach anymore. So Pesach Sheni doesn't really exist anymore, but it's there on the calendar and it's, you know, so. It's it's uh, uh, a month after after Pesach, um, but the day after Pesach we begin to count towards Shavuot. Okay, so uh, and and the the linkage between Passover and Shavuot is called the counting of the Omer. We count the days from the Omer sacrifice. The Omer was a grain sacrifice that was brought in the temple the day after Passover, and then we count the days from that sacrifice, fifty days, and the fiftieth day is the holiday of Shavuot. Shavuot has no fixed date in the Torah, its date, the festival of Shavuot, is set by being 50 days after Passover. Um, and so this counting ritual, every night we count, today is day one, today is day two, today is day three, that counting connects Passover and Shavuot. Passover, the holiday commemorating our freedom from Egypt to Egyptian slavery, Shavuot commemorating the day when uh, the Torah was revealed to us on Mount Sinai, so it connects our, you know, freedom and responsibility, okay? It connects to uh, a freedom from with freedom to, okay? A covenant of fate and a covenant of destiny, okay? These are all the, the themes of these two holidays are, are in dialogue with each other, are connected to each other through this ritual counting 
and pass over to Shavuot. It's a mitzvah to count every night. So uh, it's a very easy mitzvah to do. You just have to remember to count. Today is day four, or today is day five. Um, and that's done you know, in the synagogue at evening services. You can do it at your home before bedtime, after dinner. Um, and that, that, that links Passover and Shavuot. Um, something you may see, you may some people when talking about counting, the midst of counting the Omer, they may say, well, never, don't forget to count the Omer, we're about to count the Omer. Yesterday, we counted day six. Why did they say yesterday? Because, because if they said, well, today we count day seven, it would be too late to count, right? I would have done the mitzvah, you know what I mean? If I say, let's count the Omer, today's, remember, it's the, it's the seventh day today, I already did the mitzvah because I already said what number it is, right? So instead I say, we're gonna count the Omer, yesterday we counted six, then I can say a blessing for the mitzvah, Sher Kiddush Shavah, Mitzvah Tabit Zivanu, Al Shirata Omer, the mitzvah of counting the Omer, and then I say, today is the seventh day, okay? The Torah in one place says Shavuot is seven weeks after Passover, and in other places it says you count 49 days. What's the difference between counting 49 days and seven weeks? Um, very subtle difference, we do both, okay? So we say today is the 24th day of the Omer, which is three weeks and two days, uh, two, three weeks and three days, okay, whatever, okay? We, we, we count in multiples of weeks as well. We say the day and then we count uh, in weeks as well uh, to, to fulfill the mitzvah according to the way it appears in both instances in the Torah. Um, there are customs of semi-mourning during the Omer period. Uh, the Talmud says that the students of Rabbi Akiva died during a plague during this period between Passover and Shavuot, and so there are no weddings uh, and there are other minor mourning practices between Passover and Shavuot. Also, was when the Jewish communities in Germany and France were massacred during the First Crusade, and so that's that's probably when a lot of these mourning practices were reestablished and, and, and strengthened. Um, questions about Shavuot, about Omer? I mean, whatever, come to Shul, we'll do it, okay? Like, look in the sea door, we'll, we'll do it in just a few weeks. Um, uh, and that brings us to Shavuot, which we'll talk about next time, okay? But that's that's sort of the culmination of this process, okay? The, 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 the um, and the holiday that commemorates, uh, again, the, the revelation at Sinai. All right, I'm going to stop recording now.